I think that one of the problems that Christopher Andrew has got with this book is that he is a historian who tells the truth, but he's writing the history of an institution, an organisation that doesn't always tell the truth. In fact, most organisations don't. They have this thing called the institutional truth. It's not what happened, it's what the organisation wants the rest of the world to think happened. Indeed, they may persuade themselves it happened, but it didn't. An inquest absolved the SAS of any wrongdoing. Later, the European Court of Human Rights ruled the killings unnecessary. MI5 felt damaged by the Gibraltar incident because if you are accused in a BAFTA-winning film of operating a shoot-to-kill policy, and many people uh, believe that, then you know, both your reputation and your morale is necessarily affected. Three years after the Gibraltar shootings, another IRA operation in the heart of the British government put MI5 in a central counter-terrorism role. In an audacious attack, the IRA fired mortars at 10 Downing Street, just as Prime Minister John Major was holding a cabinet meeting. Major said afterwards that he had been told that if the mortar, which was fired from a white van on Hosgarts Avenue, had got 10 foot closer, there would have been deaths in the cabinet room. And it was very close to being the biggest success in the entire history of Irish Republican terrorism. It was a turning point. Major was very, very annoyed. He reached the conclusion that it was time for the lead intelligence role against the IRA on the British mainland to be transferred to MI5 for the first time. Soon afterwards, it emerged that Major's government was involved in back-channel conversations with the IRA, contrary to official policy. The files in MI5's headquarters confirmed that a number of its officers were instrumental in making these talks happen. We were intimately involved in, in, in these, these discussions. They were really important, I think, because they started the process or they reinforced the process of the provisionals thinking about politics and thinking about the potential for political gains absent violence. This will be the image remembered in history. The Ulster Unionist and Sinn Féin leaders applauding the same thing. With Irish terrorists laying down their arms in favour of the ballot box and the Cold War over, MI5 was looking at an uncertain future in the late 1990s. Then a new adversary appeared, bigger than any that had gone before. When 9-11 shocked the world, Al-Qaeda was already on MI5's radar. But no one was prepared for suicide bombers using planes. The service was slow cottoning on to Al-Qaeda. So was the whole of Whitehall. So was the whole of the media. In fact, MI5 had already foiled an Al-Qaeda-inspired plot without fully realizing it. So far as we know, the first Islamist bomb factory almost established in Britain happened over a year before 9-11. Fortunately, the man who was seeking to establish it, who was somebody called Moinul Abedin, was under surveillance. He was caught in Operation Large. He was arrested. He is now spending a long time in prison. At that stage, we were rather thinking about foreign nationals coming into the country, because that's what we'd hitherto seen. Aberdeen was of Bangladeshi origin, but a British citizen. The rules of engagement were changing, and a new threat was emerging. The events of 7-7 shocked MI5 and the police counterterrorism unit. They had not expected homegrown suicide bombers. It became clear within a day or two that what we were looking at was British suicide bombers, a completely new challenge for us and one of the biggest changes in terms of directing a response to counterterrorism. Now what we see is just simply a determination to kill as many people as possible. That seems to be the ambition of terrorists both here and overseas, and the casualty toll is immeasurably higher than it was from the Irish terrorist threat. 
thing about the IRA is they always wanted to go home and have a Guinness. They weren't, uh, you know, martyrs. So you could um, uh, you could sort of um, take some ranging shots as to what they might do, which were easier than current targets. If we can learn anything from history, it's that Al Qaeda and those groups actually repeat their targeting, they repeat their attack methods. They've tried it before, they tried it in 2006, and I have no doubt at all that they will try it again. After 7-7 came criticism. Why hadn't MI5 identified and stopped the bombers? The Intelligence and Security Committee concluded that the number of potential terrorists was greater than the resources MI5 had to deal with the threat. Four years on, MI5 is being called to answer another allegation, complicity in torture. Binyam Mohammed Al-Habashi, an Ethiopian-born UK resident, claims he was tortured in Pakistan and Morocco and that his torturers received questions and materials from British intelligence. The allegations are still unproven, but if true, run contrary to an MI5 ethos established during the Second World War. German agents were interrogated at Camp 020 in Surrey, run by Colonel Robin Stevens, known as Tinai. He was called Tinai because he always wore a monocle. He had the manners and the appearance of a Prussian sergeant major, barked at the people who came in, told them they were reptiles, and he was going to treat them as reptiles, unless they would work with him. He had one cast-iron rule which he insisted on all his staff following. You must never actually touch a prisoner. Any sort of beating them up is absolutely out of the question. Quite right, too, because if you once start beating a man up, he will tell you anything you like to get you to stop beating him up. Doesn't mean that what he tells you is true. Tinai believed information gained under torture was not reliable. And that ethos seems as old as the service itself. And one of the questions, of course, that crops up from time to time is, we want to get as much as we can out of captured agents. Should we torture them? And the answer is no, repeatedly in the MI5 files. Why do I believe these files? Well, because they were written, I know from some of the things that were written in them, uh, by people who had not the slightest idea that there was the slightest possibility that what they wrote would ever become known. MI5 files were not to become known at any point, full stop, ever. It is certainly the case that people who join the service are expected to have strong views about propriety. Generally speaking, you couldn't get them to do something naughty because they wouldn't do it. They'd say, no, no, that's not proper. And that's a good thing, it's healthy and the staff's sort of own sense of what's right and wrong is a very strong part of the service's tradition. The final word lies with the police and the courts. But it might be one of those controversies that even the files cannot lay to rest. After six years studying its secrets, Christopher Andrew believes the files don't just have lessons for MI5. I think that the old saying that those who do not understand past mistakes are jolly likely to uh, repeat them happened in the case of MI5 as it happened in the case of British government time after time after time. After a hundred years, MI5 is proud of its history, but realistic about its future. Some of the things we've done have been first class and some of the things haven't been first class. You're not going to get all the judgments right. You're not going to get the intelligence you need on every case. So you expect not to win every war, as it were, or not to win every battle, just to win the wars.